Uh, so hello and welcome everyone to the next event in our webinar series. Uh, this will be a presentation by guest speaker, Dr. John Jost on chip scale frequency film sources. My name is Garrett Cole. I'm the technology manager at Thor Labs Crystalline Solutions in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, today, I take great pleasure in moderating the webinar as I've been in close contact with John since he originally moved to Switzerland in 2012. I have to say, made the unfortunate decision to not come and be my lab mate in Vienna, uh, but I won't. I won't hold it against him. So, John received his PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder, working with the esteemed Nobel laureate David Wineland on ion-based quantum computing. After leaving Boulder, John was a postdoc at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, which I'm sure I just mispronounced, and is now the founder of Enlitra, a startup pioneering multicolor lasers for optical communication and next-generation photonic computing. Throughout John's talk, please feel free to submit any questions uh, that you may have using the Q&A tool, and John will be answering these questions following his presentation. So at this time, I'd like to hand off uh, the talk to John, and I very much look forward to it. Thank you very much, Gerrit, and uh, also thank you very much to Michelle for the amazing organization with everything. So I can say to any of the audience members, if they ever ask you to give you a talk for a Thor Lab seminar, definitely, definitely say yes. It's a great experience. One of the things that Michelle, Garrett, I, and everyone here online share in common is that we, we love to consume and use information, whether that's writing emails or watching Netflix videos and YouTube, it's something that we all do. And we all take it for granted how easily and how everything seamlessly works. But that's, that's not always the case. And uh, let's go back to a story that happened during COVID. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I definitely remember when we were all in lockdown, sitting at home, watching Netflix and YouTube, this headline started to show up. Something like this on the New York Times. Surging traffic is slowing down our internet. Or something like this from CNN. Netflix and YouTube are slowing down Europe's internet uh, in order to keep it from, sorry, Netflix and YouTube are slowing down in order to keep Europe's internet from breaking. I remember sitting at home uh, watching my Netflix video on, on the crappy quality and thinking to myself, why, why is this happening? As a physicist, I was sure that we had this sort of capacity built in to our, to our technology, but it turns out it's simply not the case. And uh, you, you would think that it's there, but it really, really isn't. But there's more than one problem with that. In addition, all this consumption, all this video watching that we're doing uses a huge amount of energy, um, something I never really considered before I got into this, this field. But some of the project projections, if they're correct, say that by 2010, or sorry, by 2020, data centers will use somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the world's energy. It's, a, it's an amazing, an amazing amount. And I think we can see some of the problems here already since the slides seem to jump, jump ahead uh, at a different rate than when I'm clicking on them. So obviously there's more than one problem to fix, fix with the internet. But as we can see, um, let's try, try it a different way. But there's perhaps even additional problems that are coming up now with the future, with the advent of things like AI. So let's look at this plot here. This is from OpenAI and what it looks at is it shows how computing resources have changed over time in order to do various artificial intelligence calculations. On the horizontal axis, you have uh, time and years. On the vertical axis, you have something called petaflops per second days. Uh, what is this exactly? Uh, petaflop is basically um, a calculation. And this unit is kind of like kilowatts per hour. It's a measure of the total calculation power required to do, a, to do something. So you can see here from 1960 up till about 2012, it's had this uh, relatively modest slope. So it's a two year doubling. So that's essentially what Moore's law is. It's doubling every two years. However, around 2012, you can see the slope greatly increases. And what this is showing is that uh, the calculation capacity required for all these things is outstripping Moore's law. And Moore's law is what has governed the, for a long time, the computing capacity that we have. So really what this shows is that uh, the way we're doing things currently can no longer keep up with our needs. And to give you a sense of what this scaling means now, 
in from 2012 to now, especially thanks to things like ChatGPT, the computing resources required are doubling every three to four months. So that means in two years time, there's a factor of 10 increase in the required performance. And the current technologies are simply not keeping up. And so really what's important here is us to move communications from the picture on the left, going very slow, single lane, to the right where we have high capacity, many, many channels. So we need to be able to really transmit more data faster and more energy efficiently. Now this brings us back to data centers and communication. And there's, there's more than one limit, I would say, that limits the performance coin up. But in this talk, we'll focus on one key one. That's a key bottleneck for the systems. And as you could guess, the talk is about lasers. So one of the key problems right now with today's technology is that we use single color lasers to transmit information. So what you do is you can encode light, encode information on light by turning it on and off. And that's how we send the information. If we need to send more, we have a second laser and so on. But we're reaching the practical limits to how much information we can send. To get a sense for that and what these limitations are, let's look at this data. This is from a presentation by NVIDIA at ECOC of 2022. And what they plot here versus time on the horizontal axis is what's typically available uh, commercial data rates. So it's how much, how fast, or how much information you can send on a single laser at one time. Back in 2010, it was about 10 gigabits per second, and that's been slowly increasing with time. And now in 2022, it's around 100 gigabits per second. So how does this scaling compare compare with what we what we need for our growing demands? So if you look at it, this scales roughly. It's a factor of two every three years. So if you recall Moore's law, which has governed things for a long time, is a factor of two every two years. So this isn't even keeping up with that. But now, since 2012, the compute requirements have gone up a factor of two every four months. So there's no way our current way of doing things is keeping up. Let's look at it, the problems this creates in another, in another way. Uh, this picture here from NVIDIA is of their new EOS supercomputer, which can do 18 exaflops. What's an exaflop? Well, it's a, it's a lot of computing power. To give you a sense, uh, this system should be able to do the large language model training for chat GPT-3 in about half a day. And it uses more than 30,000 optical transceivers. And what that corresponds to in lasers is more than 200,000 individual lasers. So it's a huge amount. And you can just imagine if you have several of these computers, this is going to scale. And another problem that's brings with this is, is failures, right? There's lots of things in here that can die. But lasers being one of the more active components uh, are something that are highly likely to, to break. So even though telecom lasers work very well, they might have a, a failure rate uh, typically about two times in, let's say, a billion hours. That's a typical number. So it doesn't seem like a lot of two failures in a billion hours of operations. However, with this 200,000 lasers, then what you get is you get one laser will fail about every three months. So it's not going to break the system, but it's definitely far from ideal, especially when you take into effect there's other components that will also fail. Now, this is just two examples from uh, communications or data processing where the lasers, single color lasers start to create some challenges. Let's look at the overall optical communication industry as a whole to see who is having these problems. So it turns out when you want to transmit information, you can more or less categorize the different technologies and needs based on the distance over which you want to send information. On the left here, there's what they refer to as long haul or subsea. This is when you're sending uh, internet under sub subsea cable between Europe and the US. This is typically a thousand kilometers. On the next smaller size scales, often referred to as Metro or DCI, where DCI stands for Data Center Interconnect. So this is connecting data centers together or cities to cities, and this is distances about 100 kilometers. Now you have um, data centers, so actually inside the data center itself, which is its own class. And here the distances are on the order of a kilometer. 
Now, moving down in size scale again, you have the individual server racks um, that contain the servers and the computers. And typically on top, there's a switch. And that can be connected by a meter to 10 centimeters, depending on the length. And that's a different set of problems because you have lots of information going into a single uh, switch. Now, moving down one size scale further, you get to the generation of what's called HPC or high performance computing. This is uh, very in vogue right now, thanks to things like uh, artificial intelligence. And there's a growing push to use optics in the high performance computers to do all the connections between the different GPUs. So this is now distances on the scale of about a centimeter or less. And each one of these technologies has different, different needs. But which ones actually really suffer from this bandwidth issues and uh, having too many lasers? Well, if we look at it, uh, I would say everything except inside the data centers could benefit from multicolor lasers. And let's again go from the left to the right. There's, there's long haul and Metro DCI. This works with a technology called coherent communication, where you use both the amplitude and the phase of light to send information. And it's traditionally done in what's called the C-band or around 15, 50 nanometers. If you move down to the center here in data centers, I would say right now for multicolor lasers or cone lasers, there's not really a good application inside the data centers yet, because here is typically the domain of you know, short connections that are not very fast, you know, 10, 25 gigabit per second. They're very cheap and they have a lot of them. So they still have room to push into some of the more high-end technologies. So that one will put on hold. However, if you move down in size scale, then um, you start to become interesting again with multicolor lasers. This is things like the, perhaps let's say the uh, EOS supercomputer. Now, with all the high density going into the switches, you need high capacity and lots of bandwidth. However, inside the data center, everything is done in what's called the O-band, which is around 1,300 nanometers. And here they use a different sort of modulation scheme, often referred to as direct detect. Simply what that means is they change the amplitude of the laser in order to send information. And this also applies when you move down to high performance, high performance computing, connecting chips together as well. And again, here you have a density issue as well as energy issues because you really want to transmit a lot of information over a very small space. So why is this problem not solved? What are the problems with uh, scaling, scaling up bandwidth? How can we do that better? So first, uh, let's look at different ways that we could scale up the bandwidth. In particular, uh, the first obvious thing might be speed. Let's just take a single color laser and go faster. And as I alluded to earlier in my presentation, uh, we're approaching the limits to how fast we can go. So right now we're at, you go going from 50 gigabaud to 100 gigabaud gives you a factor of two. You could push up to 200 gigabaud or gigahertz or gigabits per second. It's all, all about the same. Uh, and that gives you another factor of two. However, the question is, why can't you go further? Well, I mean, in principle, that is possible. However, dealing with the electronics and the signal processing to go from 100 gigabaud to 200 gigabaud gets increasingly difficult. So it's hard to imagine that you can get up to, let's say, terahertz modulation rates in any foreseeable future. So there's, there is some ways you can push here, but it's probably not the way we're going to win uh, capacity in the easiest fashion. In addition, there's the modulation schemes. So here I consider a coherent modulation where you can change both the amplitude and phase. And in this um, current technology uses 16 QAM. What does QAM mean? It means quadrature amplitude modulation. Again, it means you're both, you're putting information on both the phase and the amplitude of light. And you can discretize that in different, different levels to give you more or less capacity. Going from 16 QAM to 64 QAM only gives you a factor of one and a half increase. And 64 QAM is already kind of pushing the limits of technology. It's possible to go to 256, but here again, there starts to be more stringent requirements on the systems and makes it cost uh, prohibitive and not practical to go even further. So there's some limits there as well. In addition, there's polarization. So you can go from horizontal to vertical. This should actually give you a factor of two increase, not a factor of one and a half. However, that, what does else that leave you with? Well, that leaves you with my favorite, doing multicolor lasers, which is wavelength. Here, this is something that has barely been tapped. So if you start from one laser and go to two lasers, you have twice the bandwidth, four lasers, four times, and so on. 
And here, really, the limit is just what you can put down an optical fiber. So a single SMF 28 fiber can contain many, many colors. So we haven't even begun to tap what is possible here. Now, coming back to the problem. So perhaps now you can start to see where I'm going with this presentation on what the possible solution is. So really, it's, it's not speed we can really increase. What it really boils down to in order to solve some of these problems is we need multicolor lasers or comb lasers. So really, the key message for this talk is that comb lasers can be used to create the Autobahn for communication. Now, let's start with some definitions. What is and is not a comb laser? Uh, I have some bias here. I come from a frequency metrology background, and I used to work in the lab where optical frequency combs were, were invented. So I have a particular definition. So what that is, an optical frequency comb or comb laser, is really when you have a coherent set of lines with a well-defined phase, and that gives you a pulse in the time domain, but in the frequency domain, what they call an optical frequency comb. Here, there's a well-defined frequency and phase relationship between all the different colors. And this is really what a comb laser is. However, uh, in the telecommunications industry, uh, they have a different, some different definitions. And I'm not influential enough to really change that. So I guess we need to go with what they consider a comb laser. So in telecommunications or datacom, basically any multicolor laser, even if it's a bunch of lasers, that's still considered a comb laser. So, for example, a bank of lasers in the optical communication world is considered a comb laser. This can consist of, for example, DFB lasers. DFB stands for distributed feedback laser or DBR lasers, uh, distributed Bragg reflector. So really what this is, again, it's individual lasers, perhaps with different colors. They're all fabricated together in a single, a single bar. However, this sort of technology is very promising as a solution for doing multi-wavelength sources for optical communication. And actually, one of the pioneers for that, really pushing that forward, is Intel. And they've made some great, great strides with that. Here's a slide from a presentation at Intel where they demonstrate their next generation optical transceiver, which communicates information at 1.6 terabytes per second. If you recall from earlier, current technology does around 100 gigabytes per second for a single color laser. So in order to get 1.6 terabytes, that means they need 16 lasers on a chip to do that. And that's what they show here in the center of the picture. However, in order to be redundant in case something fails, they fabricate an additional 16 lasers just to have one in backup. So this works, um, but one might start to ask, um, especially with the way capacity is increasing, is this sustainable? So if we want to go to 3.2 terabits, that's you know now 64 lasers and keep on going, it quickly becomes potentially an intractable um, number of lasers to put on a single chip. So where that point is, it still remains to be seen by the field. Now let's look at some other types of comb lasers. In addition, um, another type of comb laser is a, a mode lock laser. So for those of you who come from the laser background, this is perhaps a very familiar technology that's been around for long, long time. Mode lock lasers when you have an optical cavity with some gain and a satural absorber. Inside. Examples like this in free space might be a titanium sapphire laser, which gives you femtosecond pulses. Well, that's a free space system, but you can translate this also onto a photonic integrated circuit, where now your cavity is made up by the waveguides, and your satural absorber comes from placing some gain on the, on the photonic integrated circuit itself. And that allows you to make a mode lock laser source uh, which has some very nice properties. Moving on, there's also quantum dot lasers, which are also another type of mode lock source, but because they're one of the popular systems for next generation communications, I separated them out. Here, what they do, instead of using a typical quantum well, as you most let's say DFB lasers, they fabricate quantum dots. And this is just a different type of structure. However, you can put many of these quantum dots in a single, in a single cavity that allows you to make a, a multicolor laser that puts out many colors. These have some very nice properties which make them a strong candidate for optical communications. In addition, there's what's called gain switch lasers. Uh, this uses a traditional semiconductor gain material. It can be 
basically a laser or a laser that's pumping another piece of gain section. And in order to make the multicolor laser, what you do is you modulate the current of the gain section at a very high frequency. So you can think about this as you know, turning the laser on and off very quickly. And what this does in the frequency domain is make sidebands. And this allows you to make a comb source. There's a nice phase relationship between all the different channels. And this has some advantages in terms of flexibility and uh, tunability that I'll cover, cover later. However, my favorite type, because this is what Enlytra does, are Kerr combs. And this uses what's called the Kerr effect uh, in, in materials. So some materials have this, some don't. But silicon nitride, which is now a common photonic integrated circuit material, has the nonlinear Kerr nonlinearity. So what does this allow you to do? Well, what the Kerr effect um, does is if you take, say, a resonator and you put light into it, and that light builds up and gets very strong in intensity and starts uh, exciting the nonlinear interactions, what can happen is you get degenerate and non-degenerate forward mixing. And what that means is you take photons from the single color pump and you convert them into multiple colors. And this is where we get our, our comb source from. The nice thing about that is due to energy conservation, all the lines are equidistantly spaced. And so they're, they're forced to be that way. They're all in phase and very coherent with each other. Another type of comb laser called electro-optic combs. Uh, this is uh, perhaps somewhat straightforward to understand. You take a single color laser and you put it through a phase modulator. Now uh, you modulate this and put side bands on your laser. You can then take that and put that through another phase modulator, phase modulator and then kind of cascade this out. And this allows you to make a, a relatively broad comb where now you can tune the spacing just by changing the frequency of your RF oscillator. Now, these are all examples of what we call chip scale comb source. Now, all these things can be integrated. Now, what does it mean to be an integrated comb source? Well, there's different levels of integration uh, in this field. So let's talk about the different types. Let's start from the perhaps the most complete, which is a monolithic comb source. What do I mean by that? Monolithic mean basically everything is grown together. You start with a wafer of silicon, you grow your gain section on top of it and all your different layers. So it really is a single, a single piece that's been fabricated. The challenges with this and why it's not readily available for all these systems is because there's often very different temperature coefficients for these different materials. They have different lattice constants. And what this means is it makes it very hard to do all this growth. So this is an active area of development, so we'll see what happens in the next next few years. Now, the next level of integration, I would say, up from that is what they refer to as heterogeneous integration. This means you have a photonic integrated circuit, and then you can either print or put other materials in the circuit um, in, a, in a more integrated fashion. So for here's an example of a photo of a heterogeneously integrated mode lock laser, where you can see the, the rings from the waveguide, and they put the satchel absorber gain section on the photonic integrated circuit. This allows you to work with a range of different materials, uh, and it's a, it's a nice way to move things forward with the tech, different technologies. Now, again, one level of less integration is what they call hybrid integration. So there's really a blurred line between what is hybrid integration and what is heterogeneous integration. However, I think the, the simple answer is hybrid integration is you're, you're kind of just gluing stuff together or welding things in place. Uh, so as you can see a picture here of a hybrid integrated source, you, you butt couple your laser, you glue your photonic chip down. However, this may sound quite kludgy, but actually most telecom uh, lasers that you can reach telecordia qualification are a form of hybrid integration. You have a laser, you have a lens, you have an optical fiber, uh, isolator, all these things are, are glued in place. It works and it works very well, surprisingly. So this is also a path forward. Now, now that we have these different chip scale technologies, how can we implement them? What can they actually be used for? Do they actually work for these different applications? So again, if you recall, um, the applications can broadly be spit by distance. So there's longer distances, which is the range of telecom, and then the shorter distance, which is often referred to as data communication. And each one of these have somewhat similar, but different requirements. And so let's look at some of these differences a little bit more closely. Again, on the left, you have telecom, which is long distance. This is the domain of coherent communication at 1550 nanometers. Typically, the lasers are tunable, so you change the color to the different um, 
channel that you want. Here you would like to have high powers per line, typically greater than 10 dBm or even more. In order for the coherent communication to work well, then you need very pure colors. And also because these things can go from the bottom of the sea to somewhere very hot, they need to work over a very broad temperature range from minus 40 C to 150 C. Now for high performance computing or things inside the data center, the requirements are, are similar but different. Here again, you're using direct detect, changing the amplitude. Uh, you're working in the O band, which is 1300 nanometers. Here, there's not really tunable lasers. Everything is a fixed color. Now coming to the power per line, well, in, in reality, I don't think I've ever done an experiment or anything where I could say I had more laser power than I needed. It's also the case here. If you look at some of the industry standards, they say they'd like to have more than 10 dBm. But then talking to some of the system integrators and system architects, it's possible to do things at much lower powers because the distances can be very short, just a few, a few centimeters or less for high-performance computing. So in some cases, you can get away with even below 0 dBm per line. Here in uh, direct detect, you don't really care about the laser line width. Megahertz, 10 megahertz is fine for the width of the width of the comb tube. And because data centers are somewhat controlled environments, they, they rarely drop below freezing. So between room temperature and around 85 C are typical requirements for comb laser oper for laser operation in general. Now let's look at some of the different. Um, compare some of the different types of, let's say, things that people care about for these different comb lasers. So you have, can they work for coherent modulation, direct detect, the C band, the O band? What is the line width? Are they sensitive to temperature changes? What about the power per line? Is the line spacing, can you get the spacings that you actually need to be able to reliably send information? Is the spacing stable? And perhaps very importantly, what is the wall plug efficiency? How easily or how energy efficiently does it convert electricity into into light so let's look at the first system laser dfb arrays uh, for coherent modu modulation they're okay this is because they have a modest line width so a typical line width for a laser dfb array would be on the megahertz the 10 megahertz level however they can get down to 100 kilohertz now for intensity modulation the next next column over they work very well and laser DFB arrays can be fabricated throughout the C band and O band. Again, they have limited line width. However, they have, they're quite sensitive to temperature. Typically, uh, the laser material shifts about 0.1 nanometer per degree Celsius, which is quite a bit. However, in terms of power per line, they can be very high power per line. So this is one area where they excel. And you can fabricate a range of spacings from probably down to about 50 gigahertz up to a tera, it's just where you, where you center the frequency of your lasers. However, again, due to the temperature sensitivity and change with the uh, wavelength with current, the line spacing stability is somewhat limited, but they are very efficient in terms of energy usage. Now, uh, my favorite platform, curve microresonator combs. Let's look at those. So they actually can have very, very narrow line widths, uh, sub kilohertz, and that means they're very good for coherent modulation as well as direct detect. Uh, the combs can be very broad band, so you can make something work in the C band or the O band, and they have very narrow line width. And actually, um, turns out they have a factor of 10 better temperature sensitivity than uh, DFB materials. However, we, they do suffer from having low power per line and having not necessarily a flat top spectrum, which is something that people care about in optical communications. You can create a range of line spacings, you know, from 20 gigahertz up to a terahertz, and this line spacing stability is excellent. And I would say they have modest wall plug efficiency. In terms of quantum dot lasers, which is another very popular one for optical communications, in terms of coherent modulation, due to the broader line widths, they're they're so so on that. However, excellent for direct detect. There is less commercially available things in the C band, although there's lots of research papers on C band quantum dot lasers. However, in the O band, they, they work quite well. Um, again, the line width are so so, and they have the same temperature sensitivity in terms of drifts uh, comparable to DFB laser. However, they can be very, very powerful, powerful laser, especially in the O band. Um, but again, the line spacing due to this is, uh, due to the material is somewhat um, limited in terms of what you can do from, let's say, probably 10 gigahertz up to 100 gigahertz. And again, the stability is somewhat 
somewhat average. However, they are very efficient lasers in terms of converting electricity into, into light. Mode lock lasers, again here, um, they typically have modest to poor, poor line widths, but they're very good for direct detect, and they can span both the C and the O band. And again, they can be very sensitive to temperature and have modest powers per line uh, and line spacing and stability, as well as uh, wall plug conversion efficiency. In terms of uh, gain switched lasers, uh, here, again, you can use uh, a very narrow line width laser to seed the gain switched material. So you can be very good for coherent modulation uh, as well as intensity. However, in terms of the width that you can span with your multicolor laser source, it, it doesn't, it's not very broad. So that applies both to the C and O band. We have very good line width as well as poor temperature sensitivity. But you can get very uh, reasonable powers as well as flat, flat top spectrum. Uh, and the line spacing, again, is limited to the modulation frequencies that you can put on the laser. So this makes it hard to extend things past, you know, 20 gigahertz. But the stability is determined by your RF source, so it can be very, very good. And it has modest wall plug efficiency. Now, the last one, electro-optic combs. This is a great technology for test and measurement. It's very versatile. The line width can be very, very narrow. Uh, it can be good for coherent and incoherent modulation. Uh, they can span wherever you have a modulator to put the modulation signal on the laser, so the C-band and O-band, as well as the line width. So here is modest temperature sensitivity because the modulators can drift. Uh, the power per line, um, again, it's modest. And the line spacing, I marked as poor because it's it's tough to modulate uh, you know, higher than a few tens of gigahertz on these cascaded modulators. So that limits the range over which you can uh, do different line spacings. However, it can be very, very tunable. And the stability, actually, this should be green because it's determined by the basically the stability of your RF source. However, they consume a fair, a fair amount of energy in order to do that. So uh, at Enlytra, what we focus on is Kerr uh, micro resonator combs. So let me take just a few minutes to tell you what we're doing at Enlytra. So at Enlytra, what we do is we provide a unique combination of IP and know-how that enable comb lasers to do ultra-fast data rates. Uh, in terms of the technology, we're experts in that. We have a broad range of experience with many people with uh, more than a decade of experience. And I would say in the world, we have a very unique position in terms of IP. So I think no one else can claim the IP space that we have currently. And right now is really a great time to commercialize this technology. And just to remind you again how it works, is we can start with a single, simple laser and our, everything we do is with a, with a ring, a relatively simple structure on photonic integrated circuits. We work with silicon nitride. So you couple light into a waveguide, it couples into this uh, ring resonator. And because of the very high quality factor, the light builds up and we can make use of this Kerr effect. And what that uh, allows us to do is again, use this four-way mixing that makes our optical frequency comb that is very stable and very coherent. So a little bit about the technology. Here you can see our core technology on the left. So there's uh, two squares here. There's a laser. This is a commercially available uh, DFB laser and the photonic integrated circuits that we design. So simply by doing hybrid integration of these two together, we can create from a single laser our multicolor laser source. And as from feedback from customers, what we found is they want a higher level of integration. So we're climbing up the value chain and can now offer turnkey solutions for multicolor lasers, and we plan on moving further up the value chain with more complex systems. So our technology, it's chip scale, it's mass manufacturable, and you can create up to 100 channels from a single chip. So now let me show you a little bit how we've demonstrated some of the unique capabilities of this technology. So let's talk about Enlytra's USP. Uh, if you're not from the, the startup world, what does USP mean? It stands for Unique Sales Proposition. This is the unique things about our technology. And my co-founder, Maxim Karpov, during his thesis work, did a great demonstration of the awesome capabilities of, of microcombs. So what he did is he compared what you could do with a single microcomb, what you could do with 100 um, high-level, uh, what's called ITLA lasers. This is the lasers used for coherent communication. So we did an equivalent experiment to see how much better our systems perform. So in terms of energy consumption, 
to do the same thing, we consumed 10 times less power. And so what was he able to demonstrate with that? This, excuse me, what was he able to demonstrate with this 10x reduction in power? I was able to demonstrate 50 terabit per second data rates. And to give you a sense of what that means, that's roughly 50,000 times faster than the internet connection I'm using to do this, do this video. So what that means is um, our, our single system can be a, equivalent to 100 individual lasers, so we get 100 times faster, while at the same time getting a 10x decrease in the overall energy. Now, this was from a few years ago, but looking towards the future, what is really the sort of the potential of multicolor lasers? And I think that's really uh, expressed well um, by Leif and his team at the Danish Technical University with an experiment that they did last October. And I really, really like this work. So they used a single micro-resonator frequency comb to, with, in combination with spatial division multiplexing to demonstrate two petabit per second data rates. What does that mean? What, uh, what is two petabits per second? If you were to take all the information on the internet that's transmitted in a day, it's about two petabits. So here, a single laser was able to handle the capacity of the entire internet. So the potential here is great. And this is really where Enlitra is going. Now, as a, giving a presentation, it's always important to, I've learned to, you know, my, my business training is that we need to have an ask. What are we looking for? What can I ask from you guys? What we're looking for customers. So if anybody has, has any extra money at the end of the fiscal year, we'd be happy to chat with you. Um, but, but we're also happy to discuss with people for tests and development partners. And I know uh, the Thor Labs the community has probably attracted a lot of very, very smart people. So I'm sure some of you out there may be potential employees for us. We're currently looking for senior telecom and datacom engineers and architects, as well as we're always looking for photonic integrated circuit designers. However, if you would like to know more, please feel um, scan this QR code in the lower left-hand corner. You can book an appointment directly in my calendar. But perhaps more importantly is in the lower right-hand corner. I'd be very happy to have your feedback on this presentation. What did I do well? What can we do better? Or Tell me if everything I said was crap, but that's also fine too. But really what I want you to take away from this is what Enlitra is doing. So we're creating the Autobahn for communications using our multicolor lasers, and we look forward to seeing you on it. All right, fantastic. Thank you, John, for that excellent and informative presentation. Uh, we already have a few questions, but again, I'd like to invite the audience to continue submitting any questions that you may have. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first question, if you're ready, John. Uh -huh. uh, this is from Richard Kindler, and the question is specific to the silicon nitride microresonators. Um, what are typical quality factors uh, that you can quote? And uh, let's say in the passive waveguides, what sort of losses do you typically see? Yeah, so here this is, um, yeah, this I can answer. So we typically would like to have a quality factor on the order of, 10 to the 6. And um, what is this in losses? It winds up being, I think, on the order of 0 0.2 dB per centimeter, which is available now, I would say, in most of the commercial fabs doing silicon nitride. Some are better. There's maybe a factor or two or so difference. But uh, if you look at what's available now, even in some of the big players, they have these levels. So that's why we're really excited about that this technology can really make the transition to mass mass manufacturing yeah very nice and yeah I, I forgot to preface it again i understand this is a you know startup in a let's say competitive space so feel free to pass on questions that you don't feel comfortable asking um next question no problem. Is, is related and um yeah is the um comb spacing matched to the ITU grid, or are there other design parameters that have to keep in mind for, say, like the um, FSR of the, the microresonators? I'll start with that. No, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, are the combs matched to the ITU grid? Uh, this is something that is possible. It, um, I guess the things, for example, what sets the FSR spacing? Uh, Really, this is then on the design tolerances, uh, manufacturing tolerances of the of the fabs that we work with. So again, the the spacing is really determined by the size of the ring. And 
So that can be reasonably well, although there can be, so that gives you a very precise spacing. The more challenging thing here at the moment is to, let's say, then fix what we call the offset frequency, because there are some small differences can make that shift around. However, you can do some tuning and some engineering such that you can uh, engineer things and lock things to the ITU grid. So uh, that is that is possible. Yeah, very nice. Um, and then there's a couple really getting a nice uh, flood of questions right now. So a couple related questions, um, you know, relating to the low power per line. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a need for amplification like off chip via an EDFA or are there other um, uh, solutions to get around that? Mm -hmm. So no, that's a good question. And this depends a little bit again on, on the application. Um, so yes, uh, what, uh, what my colleague showed again, when we did this experiment to show 50 terabit per second data rates and, and compared it to let's say equivalent telecom systems, there we did need to amplify up um, but even taking into those those amplifiers into account in terms of the energy consumptions are still an overall energy savings. Uh, in that sense, you can see where that comes from because if you have 100 lasers um, in, for, let's say, coherent communication, there's 100 sets of current controllers, 100 sets of microprocessors, and thermoelectric coolers. So we can do away, in that case, with 99 of those. Now, coming back to the, I think, the core of the question is what is the sort of fundamental limits? Now, in reality, what happens with microcombs typically, it's not so much a, a loss in power, but it's what we call the optical to optical conversion. So you start with some amount of optical power and you convert that to your sidebands. So typically what happens is that can be more or less efficient, but then what you're left with is a strong pump central line, which is one of your comb teeth and weaker lines. Traditionally, when combs were first done, this was very low, it's one to 3% conversion. Now using new structures and new Let's say soliton physics, this can be much higher, you know, from 10%. And I think there's work from NIST showing that it's possible to even get close to 90% conversion from optical, from the pump to the other sidebands. So this is something that people are working on. This is only going to improve and be able to make things, make things flatter as well. Yeah, very nice. Um, I'll go with a related question to the, um, yeah. in your architecture, so you have the single source laser, an array of combs. Uh, what would the modulation scheme look like in that case? Like yeah, actual, so actual modulation. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's uh, a good question. So, you know, typically, I think in the telecom and datacom, there's sort of two types. Often, historically, for lower speeds, you know, say 10 gigabits, people do um, direct modulation of the laser current. So that you can directly turn the laser on and off. But this starts to tap out around, uh, you know, 20, 20 gigahertz or so. And anything above that, what people universally move towards is external modulation. So this could be a lithium niobate modulator. And this was often used in, let's say, coherent communication or anything very, very fast. So in that sense, comb sources uh, can map directly onto any of these modulation schemes. So you don't need to invent something new. However, uh, in order to access the channels, since they're all combined to do individual modulators, you'd have to demux them. However, the architecture which people are pushing for high performance computing, which I think is, is quite uh, is the way to go, is actually if you use ring modulators, so using more rings, uh, which can be done in silicon, you can have a single bus waveguide that contains all the colors, and each ring is tuned to a separate color. And so then by tuning in and out of resonance, you can individually modulate each, each comb tooth separately without having to do any of this uh, demuxing or multiplying. And the same thing for the detect side, you can have a ring that uh, separates out the color and sends it to a photo detector. So this is probably the most energy efficient way to go. And there are uh, several uh, demonstrations of that in the literature. Yeah, interesting. Uh, if you got a couple more minutes, we'll go through a, a couple more questions. Please, good questions. Uh, yeah, that's very nice. So you gave this example of uh, this Intel integrated transceiver. Um, and they had, you know, some failure safety mechanism by adding a, a bank of additional backup lasers. In your case, is something similar needed? If you have your, you know, um, sole pump laser uh, pumping the array of combs, do you plan on having some sort of fail-safe backup laser for that? Yeah, so this is a, a good question. And 
this is a conversation or a question that people ask, right? So um, you say you had one laser powering your whole system. If that went down, then um, then your whole system goes down, right? So people would say that's a disadvantage. However, at some point, there's always some granularity. So do you want to have more lasers and have just a tiny one fail, but now there's a higher prob probability of, a, of one failing? So it's a question of uh, where you want to put uh, the risk mitigation. So in our case, yeah, if you have, let's say, let's look for the example of um, the EOS computer, which has, uh, say, 200,000 lasers, right? Okay, one of those is going to fail, right? There's, it's just bound to happen. However, I mean, if you take the example, it's possible, conceivable for a single comb to power that entire system. Okay, but it has a failure rate, a very low failure rate. Okay, so you can probably afford to put a second or third in backup as risk mitigation. So overall, one would imagine just due to the failure rates that it's it's much lower in the in the longer term than having a higher quantity of things that fail on an infrequent basis. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, like you said, comparing it to the individual discrete devices it takes um, in those competing solutions, it makes it clear, right? So. Um, yeah, one more question here is, um, uh, we have a question about, you know, on the source side, this looks very promising, but are there any changes to the, um, let's say existing optical fiber network infrastructure that need to be made to accommodate this? Um, or is it plug and play? Like this is something you can interface with a, a short, medium, long haul network, depending on the specific application. Yeah. So let me answer that in, in a couple different ways. So in terms of the optical fiber, there's no change. Um, you can use the same optical fiber that's there. Obviously, that's an advantage because uh, no one wants to dig up or add a new fiber across uh, New York City or something like that. That's uh, very, very impractical. For, for direct detect, um, especially in high-performance computing, this is why it's a very exciting space. It's a bit the Wild West. There's not standards at the moment. It's moving very quickly. So it's, very, so it's not clear what is going to be the, the end case. In terms of coherent communication on the data center interconnect, uh, there's uh, both a yes and no answer. Uh, right now, most coherent communication, they take a single laser and um, tune it around to the different channels. That's one sort of standard architecture. Uh, Infinera, for example, has another one where they take a single laser and then they put a bunch of information on it and they fan it out, called an XR optics. So in that sense, um, there are some differences in terms of, let's say, the protocols used, but for example, if you had an Elytra communication box on one end and an Elytra communication box on another end of your data center, then it's fine. You just plug in the fiber in between and everything works. There's a range of answers there, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's good to see there's no fundamental changes to the network architecture, right? And like I said, digging up fiber, doing a bunch of utility changes would be non -idea. Impossible, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we got one last question here, and this is on what are the practical limits of line spacing that can be achieved? So given your architecture with the you know, CW pump, the Kerr comb, microresonator, yeah, what is the minimum line spacing uh, sort of theoretically and realistically? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so I believe in the literature, uh, I know 20 gigahertz is demonstrated, and I believe even 10 gigahertz in the microresonator combs. There's not a, a fundamental limit. It's just as you go to these uh, um, sorry, smaller spacings, 10, 20 gigahertz, you need a higher quality factor. And because you, you'll need more optical power, it turns out, to, to drive it. So that, I would say, is this more practical limit at the moment. So the commercially available quality factors probably at the moment, make it challenging to do below 50 gigahertz, I would say. And that's balanced with how much pump power you have, I would say. But uh, in terms of what has been demonstrated in the literature, that's that you can go down to 10 gigahertz. And if that improves another factor of two or three, then you potentially go smaller. Although there's, you know, then your, then your rings are getting very big on your chip, right? So it becomes yeah. perhaps uh, expensive from a commercialization standpoint, since ultimately you want to put this on some silicon wafer, and then their real estate is very, very expensive. But it seems like the sweet spot for things right at the moment is around a, a hundred gigahertz spacing for datacom and as well as telecom. Yeah, and as a naive question, someone who doesn't do optical networking, what's a 
in comparison, sort of typical spacing for like an ITU grid, what sort of channel spacing is? Yeah, I mean, so the ITU grid, they've defined things, I think, down to even 12 and a half gigahertz, so 12, 25, 75, but uh, 100 gigahertz spacing is quite quite common for, for a lot of these things. Okay, nice. So there's a, that's an interesting question just to, just to tack on to that, right? There's a bit of a debate in the field. Um, you can guess where I land after you hear my answer, but you can either take a, a single channel and go very wide. So that means you need a wide grid spacing. Um, or you have many channels and you go slower. So it's either, you know, wide and slow or you can say narrow and I guess narrow and, and fast. And but uh, for the fast, obviously, there's a limit to you know, doing anything at 100 plus gigahertz. Uh, it takes a lot of expensive equipment. So there's I think there's a lot of motivation to go in many channels um, and, and slower speeds, even if you don't use all the all the available bandwidth. Yeah, it makes sense. No, very cool. Um, yeah, I, again, I really appreciate the questions. That was a really nice dynamic Q&A. Um, so yeah, let's thank uh, John again for that very nice presentation. I'll at least clap to give some audio there. <laughs> um, I will note that on September 20th, we have another external speaker. It'll be Dr. Victoria Chu from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology who will present a webinar on quantum enhanced gravitational wave detection. And as always, you can register for this event on the website via you know, thorlabs.com slash webinars. And I'd like to thank everyone for the attendance and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon.